So I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Judge Douglas S. S. Levine. Excuse me, Levine. Uh, he was appointed to the bench by Governor Lowell P. Weicker Jr. in 1993, and he is now a judge trial referee on the Connecticut Appellate Court. He is a graduate of Colgate University, where he majored in history, and he attended Columbia School of Journalism and the University of Connecticut School of Law. Prior to being appointed to the bench, he was a federal prosecutor, and Judge Levine is a lifelong admirer of Abraham Lincoln, and I want to welcome you, Judge Levine. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me, and welcome to the folks who are here. There may not be a lot of them, but I'm sure you're all very interested in the subject, and that, that excites me. Um, I will be speaking for a while about the subject of Lincoln and the suspension of habeas corpus uh, under, uh, under Lincoln during the Civil War. Uh, I want to begin by noting I am not an historian. I don't purport to be an historian. Uh, when I talk to people who are historians, uh, I realize sometimes uh, how much I need to know. However, I have been sort of studying this, this subject for many years. I've been reading books and articles about it. I think it's a fascinating subject. And uh, I am definitely a, uh, a fan of Abraham Lincoln. In fact, a friend and I just, just returned from a trip to Springfield, Illinois, where we saw all of the, link, the key Lincoln sites, including his home, including where he gave the House Divided speech, including his law office, including the um, railroad uh, station from which he left to go to Washington, uh, and including uh, Oak Ridge Cemetery where he is buried. There's a magnificent memorial there. So, uh, you know, seeing these places really was very exciting and it, it, make, it made me feel that I, I had a better sense for Lincoln as a man. In any event, I'm going to talk about um, the subject of Lincoln and habeas corpus. Uh, I, do, I do thank the Historical Society for having me. Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate it. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to say, because of course I'm in the legal world, um, but I also live in the real world. And I wanna talk about this from a couple of different standpoints. And one is legal, obviously, um, because this is a legal issue uh, at its heart, but the other is the practical, pragmatic, and political uh, reality of the situation. And so I'm gonna kind of switch back and forth between those two things. Um, first of all, I wanna, I just wanna make sure everybody knows what habeas corpus is. Uh, habeas corpus, I actually, uh, the other day I, I, I decided I would read a little more about it. I got this I'm holding it up. I got an article from Harvard Law Review, which goes back to the 1200s. I decided it was more than I needed to know, but habeas corpus does have an, a very ancient history. Many people think that it, um, it begins with Magna Carta. It actually predates Magna Carta, which I wasn't aware of, um, but it is essentially um, a writ of habeas corpus and I will show you a petition for a writ of habeas corpus, which is used in the courts all the time to produce prisoners. A writ of habeas corpus is an order to whoever is holding a prisoner, it's usually a jailer or a marshal or someone in authority, to bring the prisoner into court so that the circumstances of their detention can be examined to make sure that it's legal. That's what a writ of habeas corpus does. It orders an official to bring someone into court before a disinterested, not an uninterested, but a disinterested magistrate who can then hear evidence and hear arguments to determine whether or not the person is being lawfully held. Uh, in the good old days in England, people would be thrown into cells. They'd be left there. They had no recourse. Over time, uh, many of the... Uh, many people, including many of the, the um, uh, folks who, who might be an opponent of the king, found that they needed some more protection. And this, this uh, developed over, over centuries, actually. Now in the United States, it is used 
very often, um, I am a judge in the Connecticut Appellate Court. We have many, many habeas cases is what we call them. And when we do, for example, this is an amended petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Let me, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a, uh, a petition requesting that a judge give permission to bring in a prisoner. This prisoner was convicted of some very serious crimes and he is claiming, and this is what most of our habeas cases are now, he's claiming that his lawyer did a bad job and that therefore his constitutional rights were violated. So he's going to come into court. He is going to uh, presumably put on witnesses to argue and to try to prove that the lawyer who represented him at his trial did such a bad job <clears throat> that he was actually deprived of his rights. We see these cases, a steady flow of these cases. Uh, it's a very important right that prisoners have because um, it is on, on occasion, they may demonstrate that in fact, they were improperly represented. It is a very tough thing to prove because in order to uh, be granted uh, relief, a prisoner has to show not only were they poorly represented, but they were barely represented because otherwise you would have a flow of convicted people being released. So, but anyway, writs of habeas corpus are still being used. Now, um, so it's, this is not just ancient history. Uh, habeas corpus means, by the way, are there any Latin scholars in our, in our small group? Okay, well, uh, habeas corpus means, essentially it means bring me the body or produce the body. So a writ of habeas corpus means, uh, is an order from a judge to someone to bring me the body into court so we can have this proceeding. Now, let's go back now to Abraham Lincoln. Um, I, again, I'm an uh, unabashed admirer, admirer of Abraham Lincoln. I think he's one of the greatest figures in American history, and I would go much farther than that, but I certainly think he's our greatest president and one of the greatest figures that I am aware of. Um, you can see a picture of Lincoln. He is, uh, he's the tall guy with the stovepipe hat. You probably figured that out. He is talking to General McClellan, who was then the commanding general of the Union Army and who would run against Lincoln in the election of 1864, by the way. And uh, I would say, thank goodness he lost badly. Uh, but Lincoln, Lincoln, uh, you, as you probably know, had a great deal of difficulty finding a general. He finally settled on Ulysses S. Grant, uh, and that was really that really sort of uh, put the North, the Union, in a position to win the war. Now, but I do want to go back to uh, 1860. 1860, there was an election. It was a very, very important election. And uh, Lincoln managed to get the nomination for president of the new Republican Party. Excuse me, I'm going to take a little drink here. He beat out some very distinguished people, including William Seward. He was nominated and he was elected in an election where he got no, uh, he did not win any southern states. Uh, he won main, mainly the northeastern states, but he was elected when he was elected. Um, that was the Southerners thought that he was going to try to destroy slavery. He repeatedly said, I'm not going to try to do that. I, we're going to leave it alone where it is. And, but, but I am opposed to its spread. But anyway, you're Abraham Lincoln. You're still practicing law in Springfield, Illinois. Um, and you know, you have this very contested election in a very divided nation. It might might sort of uh, remind us all of what's happening today. Um, and as after you're elected, a variety of Southern states start to secede from the Union. This has never happened before. Uh, there were some threats that it could happen, but it, it never happened. And so Lincoln, before he's even sworn in, is a newly elected president. And he's dealing with the fact that the Southern states are basically saying goodbye to the Union. So as you can imagine, he has quite a, a task on his hand. Um, he, uh, he 
finally gets ready to be sworn in. He is taking a, he gives this beautiful little goodbye speech. If you haven't read it, you might want to read, read the, read the speech. He's, there's one picture of him in a white suit standing outside of his house at 8th and Jackson. I was just in that house. I just walked through it with a tour guide. I got to see his bedroom and his wife's bedroom, which was next to it, where he sat and wrote, where he kept his clothing, his bed. Um, it was really incredible. Uh, the house is obviously a national monument. So Lincoln is still at home. Uh, finally, he, he he's ready to go. He's ready to uh, head to Washington to take up this incredible task. In his little speech, he says, I have a task before me that is greater than the one facing Washington. And on the way, it is discovered that there is actually a murder plot and uh, steps have to be taken to disguise his, his arrival and change trains, that sort of thing. Um, but he gets to DC, Washington DC, to the White House. It is entirely, essentially entirely unprotected. He is basically unprotected. Uh, and what happens is as the states are seceding, he is worried about the so-called border states. He, it's very important for a lot of reasons that the border states um, do not secede. One of the border states is Maryland. Well, he gets to the White House and he learns that there is chaos in Baltimore, that a mob has prevented the 6th Massachusetts uh, militia from getting on a train and continuing to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, Maryland happens to be a hotbed of, uh, of secession. Um, and there are obviously spies and Southern agents and all kinds of people who not only want to secede, but want to do harm to Lincoln and to the Union uh, in place. And so Lincoln has to decide, what am I going to do? This is one of his first big decisions. What am I going to do? Am I going to use the civil authorities, normal police and that sort of thing, to go out and uh, arrest people and make sure that there's you know, probable cause, arrest them, drag them into court, et cetera, et cetera? Or am I going to take stronger measures? Now he is, he is um, Lincoln was a very, very good lawyer. And as a general proposition, very concerned about protecting the rights of people. But in this situation, he was in a, in a fix because he determined that the normal civil process simply was not designed for this kind of a, essentially a rebellion and essentially uh, for dealing with people who are not just committing uh, average everyday crimes, but whose goal was to destroy the union, to violate all the laws and destroy the union. So he decided he had to absolutely had to suspend habeas corpus. Now he and then he told the General Winfield Scott, who was handling this matter and uh, as the head of the army at that time, that he had permission to suspend the writ of habeas corpus where he needed to. It was being delegated to him and people started to be arrested. Now, many of the people who are arrested um, and by the way, this occurred in April of 1861. So this, so Lincoln was sworn in in uh, March. In April, already things are falling apart, um, and already uh, he he was facing a, a crisis. I should add that the Maryland legislature did subsequently vote to close um, the railroads to Union troops. They did not decide to secede. Uh, which Lincoln was very concerned about, but they did close the roads to Union troops. So Lincoln decides, I have got to clear the way in Baltimore and I've got to suspend the writ. Uh, initially, um, they, um, the writ was, was suspended only in a limited area, but as time went on and as the Civil War continued on a number of occasions, I can't tell you how many, but on a number of occasions, the writ was suspended. He generally delegated it, I think maybe in all instances, to the military authorities who wanted to make sure that the, the, the Union soldiers could get through and 
first of all, protect the White House. I mean, Lincoln was uh, Lincoln had a real, a real problem because he was in the White House with very inadequate protection. He had all these states seceding, and he was aware of one murder plot. Many, many people wanted to kill him. The Southerners were already accusing him of being a tyrant because he had he was speaking out against secession. They did not believe him when he said, I don't want to undermine slavery. I just want it not to spread. That was the main promise of the Republican platform, that keep it where it is, but no more spreading. Lincoln told a story, and as you know, he was a great storyteller. He told a story of somebody sleeping out at night and camping in a, in a, uh, in a sleeping bag or whatever they called it in those days. And as he's getting out in the morning and undoing it and unzipping it, he sees there's a deadly snake in the sleeping bag. And Lincoln says, basically, the, his analogy is the deadly snake being slavery. Leave it alone where it is. Don't try to get it out of there, because if you do, if you rile it up, it might kill you. So just leave it alone where it is. He was a genius at analogies, at stories. He was also, by the way, in my opinion, a literary, probably a literary genius. If you read his second inaugural address and some of his speeches, including Gettysburg, of course, he was a, a brilliant writer. Anyway, so Lincoln, being a very good lawyer, decides if I'm going to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, I have to provide a legal justification. And so what he does is he goes to Article One, Section Nine, and we can put that up. There it is. Article one, section nine of the Constitution, which says. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. <clears throat> now, when you read that and, you know, my job for many years, for 29 years, has been often to read statutes, to read constitutional provisions. It's very interesting because you will, I'd say, what's the first thing that most people might note when taking a look at this? And Lincoln, again, is going to use this as a basis to suspend habeas corpus. Well, to me, the first thing that I notice, aside from the language itself, is it says that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended except in certain instances, but it doesn't say who has the right to suspend it. And so that provision upon which Lincoln relied does not say who can suspend the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus was recognized and call, it was called the Great Writ. It was known as a very, very important protection of individual liberty, of civil liberty, because it provided a great check on the abuse of power by people who were in power. And so one might have expected that this language would be clearer, uh, but it says what it says. Article 1, Section 9, you should know that Article 1 deals with the powers of Congress. And if you have a constitution or you get one, you will see that Article 1 basically spells out the powers that Congress is delegated. <clears throat> and then you get to section nine, and it's, it, for example, to provide uh, the Congress has the power to define and punish piracies, to provide for calling forth the militia, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get to section nine of Article One, and we have this provision about habeas corpus. So it is interesting to note that in Article One, habeas corpus was not listed as one of the things which Congress had the power to suspend, nor does it say that the president can suspend it. In other words, it doesn't say anything at all about the subject. So Lincoln has to decide why can, how can I use this uh, section to rely upon? And he basically concludes, he basically concludes that because the Congress was not even able to meet initially during the Civil War. 
And because he was the president elected by all the people, and because he had taken a presidential oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, that almost by default, he was the one who had to exercise this power. And he decides, I'm going to do it. And he does suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Secondarily, by the way, Lincoln also uh, relies on another section of the Constitution, which is Article 2, Section 2, which says, the president shall be commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. And so he determines that because there is, and by the way, he, can, he considers that there is a rebellion going on. And I, I think it's hard to argue that different people use different words, but clearly it was in the nature of a rebellion. Uh, he decides that he has two bases to exercise this power. The main discussion has been about Article 1, Section 9, uh, but he also relied on his power as president. So, um, you know, it's but the, the Congress couldn't meet. Uh, the language is ambiguous. It's, uh, it, I, I think most people will, will agree, probably, I'm interested to hear from you at the end of this talk, that civil authorities can't go and interview people who are basically uh, trying to rebel and carrying weapons and trying to stop the troops from getting through. This is not just petty anti-crime. This is a full-fledged rebellion. Um, and so Lincoln basically initially and as time goes by, tells the Congress he did what he had to do because of necessity. Lincoln, by the way, he basically says I had no real choice. I had to do it. Um, I couldn't uh, risk being unprotected. And um, by the way, if Maryland secedes, then Washington, D.C. is in an unprotected position because it's, uh, it's surrounded by states that are not uh, really going to be uh, supporters of the union. So he does it because of necessity. And Lincoln often said that necessity caused him to do what he did uh, and that he was not in charge of, of what developed during the Civil War, but that necessity forced his hand. So without too much delay, someone brings a case. Someone brings a case in Maryland because a gentleman named John Merriman was arrested, was uh, taken without resort to the writ of habeas corpus, and a lawsuit is brought. The case is brought to none other than Roger Tawney, who was the Chief Justice of the United States, the author of the infamous Dred Scott decision, and sitting, he was sitting as an individual justice, not as the Chief Justice of the court. He writes a decision called Ex Parte Merriman in which he says uh, that the president does not have the power to suspend habeas corpus. And he says, he's, he uh, pro provides the decision to the president and he basically says article one, section nine, because it's in the section of the constitution dealing with the powers of Congress that he determined that only Congress could suspend the writ of habeas corpus. And he basically tells Lincoln, you know, I'm I'm a justice. You got to do what I say. And what does Lincoln do? Lincoln completely ignores the decision uh, for a bunch of reasons, um, including the fact that it actually, as you look at it, it's a very I read it uh, over the other day. It's a very weak decision. Uh, Tawney was um, purporting to protect civil liberties. Uh, and I must say that uh, I don't want to be guilty of presentism. Presentism is applying today's values to people who lived in a different time. I think that's unfair to do. But there is a certain irony that the very author of the Dred Scott decision, the very author of the decision that helped bring about the Civil War, uh, was, uh, was concerned about civil liberties uh, of people who were being arrested and entirely unconcerned about the rights and liberties of what was then about 4 million people in slavery. But notwithstanding that, um, many, many people are arrested. Uh, some of them are, actually I was uh, 
10 years ago or so, I had a tour of San Quentin prison. I was in California. And one of the guides said that some folks from who were arrested as a result of the suspension of habeas corpus were actually shipped out to San Quentin, which I found very interesting. Um, and I want to make, uh, I want to say, uh, and we can put up the next photos, I think, that, or the next pictures, yeah, that this is a an article in from 1863, which indicates, uh, well, on the right, I believe that's in the Hartford Current, and the one on the left is from another newspaper. I'm not sure which it was, um, but in any event, the reporting there is that Two years later, the Congress ratified Lincoln's actions. So there's another argument here that even if he didn't have the authority initially, Congress ratified it. But I, if anybody is interested in exploring this uh, more, there's a book called All the Laws But One by William Rehnquist, former Chief Justice. And what it I've read it some years ago. What it demonstrates is that presidents of the United States, when there is an existential threat, to the country, and when the full extent of the danger isn't known, will almost always, almost always default to use the full complement of their power and almost always claim they have powers that they only marginally have, but they are acting because they purport to act because they are believe that they have a duty to protect the nation. Now, we know. Um, and we have to count on some of these leaders to act judiciously, right? All the laws but one. And that is based on a statement Lincoln made when he was being criticized. He said, well, you mean I have to I have to uphold the laws of habeas corpus. But what about the fact that the the rebels are violating every other law by by trying to withdraw from the U.S.? He was a very practical man. And he, of course, as president, he had to be. So that's a very, very good book. I am going to suggest some other books uh, in the time I have left for people who are interested in this subject. So uh, in, in 1864, by the way, this is a big issue in the campaign, and he is reelected. He is reelected, uh, defeating McClellan, who was nominated by the Democrats. Today, we would call McClellan sort of a dove or a peace candidate, but Lincoln was um, very popular and he was overwhelmingly elected. Um, <clears throat> so what's the good news about all of this? The good news is that we can never prove. Yes. And here is an image from Thomas Nash, famous cartoonist talking about Election Day. Um, and um, we can never prove exactly the effect of what Lincoln did. It's impossible to, to prove it. And it was ratified by Congress. And he had two colorable arguments to do what he did. What's the bad news? The bad news is that people argue, and I think they have a right to argue, that Lincoln set a very bad precedent. Because someone who's not as well-intentioned, not as decent, not as concerned about civil liberties, we can only imagine such a person appearing on the scene could use his suspension of habeas corpus as a precedent. Although, in my opinion, Lincoln had the factual basis to do it, and I would, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine anyone else having it. Um, of course, uh, in World War II, uh, President Roosevelt did uh, sign, a, he basically issued a proclamation in uh, permitting the internment of Japanese uh, citizens, not just non-citizens, citizens in camps. And so this issue of civil liberties during wartime or time of rebellion, very complicated. Uh, you may be interested in knowing that other, pres uh, other presidents have suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Lincoln did it initially, and he did it nationwide later in the Civil War. Andrew Jackson did it after the Battle of New Orleans. And Ulysses Grant did it after the Civil War because the Ku Klux Klan had begun running rampant and harassing freed slaves and others 
in some of the southern states. So Grant decided he was going to suspend the writ and deprive these people of their civil liberties and try to protect the newly freed slaves. Uh, I'd be interested to know if people think that was a good thing or a bad thing. In my opinion, it was a good thing. Um, interestingly, and I found this out in my research, Jefferson Davis, as you may know, was a senator in the Congress, and he was very actually considered a pretty distinguished person. But he became the first and only president of the Confederacy. And in his inaugural speech, he criticized Lincoln for violating the civil liberties of so many people when he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. And then about two weeks later, he suspended the writ of habeas corpus because he was concerned that in Richmond, which became the capital of the Confederacy, there were too many people who were not really loyal to uh, the Confederacy. And he wanted to make sure that the loyalists did not uh, interfere with, with the hopes and dreams of the Confederacy to establish a slave nation under the United States of America. Uh, I have to tell you all, a few years ago, I went with Matt Warshower, my historian friend, who's an expert in this area and has written about it. And I went to the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond. I had never been to Richmond. And there was a plaque on the wall that said causes of the Civil War. And the causes were listed. I believe the first one that was listed was the tariff. And then the second, I think, was slavery. And the third was states' rights. I may have that mixed up, but slavery was not listed first. And, and many people, even today, will tell you in the South that, um, that slavery was not the real cause of the Civil War, that it was the desire of the Southern states to be free. They thought they were heirs to uh, independence, the, to 1776. Unfortunately, they left out an entire category of human beings, Blacks. But that's what they believed, and that's what they said they believed. Um, and so uh, the Southerners have, a, they still have a very different view of this. We went to a cemetery, and being a, you know, born and bred New Yorker and Connecticut person, uh, I did not realize, but there were Confederate flags on almost all of the graves. And there were also a couple of former presidents of the United States who were buried there, but the Confederate flag was, was flying everywhere. So. Anyway, let's. Uh, I'm going to conclude with a few, a few uh, comments, and then take some questions. First of all, <clears throat> Lincoln knew that he was pushing or stretching the law a little bit in his arguments about his right to suspend habeas corpus. But when you think about it, the concept that Congress a collection of hundreds of people, which at that time couldn't even meet, could somehow have the power to suspend habeas corpus rather than the one individual elected by all the people whose job it was to protect the entire country, who took an oath, and who was the commander in chief, rather than the president had the right to suspend habeas corpus. It is my opinion that since the the uh, Article 1, Section 9 was unclear, that the better argument is Lincoln's argument. I'm not saying the other argument has no force. And certainly, if you are a civil libertarian, as I consider myself, by the way, you can make the argument that he overstepped his bounds. Um, secondly, uh, so Lincoln knew he was stretching the law. And we, but remember, he did not know what the extent of the danger was. And so he, maybe he overreacted, you might say. But when the country is at risk, if you take a look at Rehnquist's book or other books, the natural inclination of someone who is charged with protecting the nation is going to be to err on the side of doing a little more rather than a little less. When you, especially when you're not sure what the extent of the danger is. Um, secondly, uh, Lincoln 
we must remember when people argue about civil liberties and states' rights, Link, the Southerners wanted to create a slave nation. They, there were four million enslaved people. They wanted to maintain that system. They wanted generations of, of children to be born into slavery. They wanted to continue to have all the rights that slave masters had to break up families, brutalize people, uh, whip people, kill people. And so uh, not everyone perhaps, but I must say, I am very unsympathetic with any argument that somehow Lincoln was acting as a tyrant. I think that's ridiculous. Lincoln did use powers, extreme use of powers, yes. But a tyrant is, I think of a tyrant, I think of Hitler, Stalin, I think of Mao, I think of the great mass murderers of the 20th century. I do not think of Abraham Lincoln, who I think of as the opposite of a tyrant. So I am not sympathetic to that. But if people think he abused of authority is authority, they can make that argument. Now, um, it is true, it is true, and it must be conceded that some people may have been wrongly detained and deprived of their rights. I think anyone who denies that is denying reality. And I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. If some people were, and I hate this, I really hate this term, but I'm gonna use it. If some of the Southerners who may have been spies, who may have been assassins, who may have been planning to join this, the Confederacy, to destroy the Union and maintain slavery, if some of them were unfortunately collateral damage, a term I hate, but if they were, that was the price that Lincoln decided had to be paid. Believe me, he wasn't happy about this, but he had to do what he felt he had to do. And so I think it is true, undoubtedly, that some people's civil liberties were unfairly infringed. But if anyone has a better idea, uh, I think they should uh, express it because I do not think it is reasonable or logical to argue that the normal civil authorities, that sheriffs and police can go out, interview people, arrest them, and, and there could have been trials. Not in this exceptional, extraordinarily dangerous situation. So um, if anybody's really interested in this, I would recommend two books. The first book is, is really a great book. It was written by Mark Neely. It is called Lincoln and the Triumph of the Nation, Constitutional Conflict in the American Civil War. Uh, it won the Pulitzer Prize. It was written in 19, let's see, 11 or 13. It's, it's not a new book, but Neely goes through every issue in meticulous and subtle detail. I urge people who, who are concerned to read it. He covers the good, the bad, and the ugly of these arguments. He also talks about the issue of secession and was it lawful for states to secede? That's another huge conflict. Uh, the Southerners claimed they had every right to withdraw from the Union. And Lincoln, of course, and many Northerners said, no, you don't and we can use military force to prevent it. That's the subject of another day. And um, the book also talks about the, the Emancipation Proclamation. Was that lawful? There are, there are some scholars and many people at the time who claimed that Lincoln lacked the power to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which by the way, was premised on the proposition that as the commander in chief of the Northern armies, at time of war, that he could basically deprive the Southerners of the right to all of the materiel, to all of the people that the slaves represented. Remember, if you have slaves doing your work, then that frees you up to go out and fight in the army and try to kill some Northern soldiers. So the argument about slavery, secession, and habeas corpus is addressed in this marvelous book. I've been rereading it, by the way. It's really very subtle and wonderful. Another book I'm going to recommend is my friend Mar Matt Warshower, who is a professor at um, Central and who is an historian 
and who has written a book. He's an, ex he's an expert on many things, including military history and other things. He wrote a book called Andrew Jackson and the Politics of Martial Law, Nationalism, Civil Liberties and Partisanship. And uh, because Jackson uh, had, uh, as I mentioned, suspended the writ of habeas corpus after the Battle of New Orleans in 1815, I believe it was, 1812, 1815. And because Jackson also, in 1832, there was a secession crisis and Jackson said that if anybody tried to secede, he would personally, personally go down to South Carolina or wherever and hang anyone who tried to lead a secession movement. He was a slave owner, but he also was the president and he wanted to maintain the, the union. So these are two great books. Matt's book, I strongly recommend. It is available, um, easily available uh, on Amazon. So I think I've used my time up. I hope I've covered some of the main points and made my own position clear. My own position is Lincoln did what he had to due to necessity. There was no reasonable alternative, but it must be admitted that some people may have been, uh, may have been injured. But I'm really glad to talk about it or discuss it with anybody who wants to. We have about 15 minutes, I believe. Is that right? Yes, it is. Thank you, Judge Levine. That okay. was amazing. Can I just ask uh, one more time the title of the um, book on Andrew Jackson? Yes, that's Matt Warshower's book. It's called Andrew Jackson and the Politics of Martial Law. Came okay. out in 2007. Oh, there's one other, one other book I wanted to mention. It's actually a booklet. It's called The Privilege of the Writ of Habeas Corpus Under the Constitution. It was written by a man named Horace Binney. I just got this. It's, uh, it's part of the Leopold Classic Library. Uh, little did I know until I started really looking into this, Horace Binney was an ex-member of Congress and a lawyer in 1862 at the age of 83. He wrote this pamphlet and it goes through all the arguments in favor of and supporting Lincoln's uh, suspension of the writ. I didn't even know it existed. This man did this on his own. He did it because he wanted to do it. And it's very, very well done. Horace B-I-N-N-E-Y, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus under the constitution. And I think uh, I will, final word is if anyone wants to write me, uh, you're gonna have my email address at my chambers. Feel free, I'll send any information to you that I can and hopefully answer any questions that I'm able to. I'm just putting your email in the chat. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, or here's a question from Graham. Can you just dis discuss the distinction made Lincoln made in suspending the writ as it pertains to Southerners versus Northerners? Did, did he, he didn't recognize Confederates as having left the Union. Does this matter? Right, there's a big issue about that. Lincoln, uh, you know, used very precise language because he didn't want to recognize the possibility or the legality of using uh, the union. Um, my belief is, and my not, to the best of my knowledge, he did not recognize a uh, distinction. In fact, one of the uh, one of the big cases uh, that came up later had to do with uh, Valendingham, I believe it is from Ohio, and he was more concerned about the, frankly, the loyalties of the individual than where they, where they lived or whether they were a Northern or a Southerner. Obviously, a large, large, large percentage of people who were disloyal to the Union and he can, who he considered rebels were Southerners. But I, I'm almost certain that, it's, uh, that there was no expressed distinction at least none that I'm aware of. Let's see. Any other questions? While we're giving people a minute to think. I had a question. In, in 1861, when Lincoln um, first suspended um, habeas corpus, did other Republicans, what were their thinking on his decision? Agree, disagree? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a really good question because it was a very controversial thing. There were many, uh, many who agreed with him. Uh, you know, basically they felt that the United States of America was being ripped apart by, by the slave power. And they were not too sympathetic to the, argue of, to the argument of states' rights. Some of them, however, did disagree. And, you know, I would say there, are, I don't know the percentages or the numbers, and I don't think anyone does because there were no polls. So it's impossible to determine it. But there, it was a, um, there was a, a, a split of opinion. Interestingly, Alexander Stevens was a member of Congress. Uh, he knew Lincoln, and he was the vice president of the con Confederacy. And um, he criticized um, President Jefferson Davis openly and virulently for suspending the writ in the southern states. So uh, I always found that um, to be a rather interesting fact. Uh, but the answer to your question is that there were some who were for it, some who were against it. After the Civil War was over, there were Supreme Court decisions uh, basically saying that it was unlawful. Uh, and as I said, Lincoln had completely ignored uh, ex parte Merriman. He thought it was wrong. And he did rely on the distinction that the chief justice was acting as a single justice in his, in his chambers, not acting in the capacity of chief justice of the Supreme Court sitting as a Supreme Court. Uh, I must say that Merriman, which I just reread, is a bad decision. And if you add that to um, Dred Scott, I, I, I must say, I don't think that, uh, that the uh, author, Judge uh, Justice Taney, uh, is really, would, I wouldn't put him in the top 10 of judges that I, that I admire. Anyone else have any questions? You can certainly raise your hand or feel, feel free to unmute yourself or anyone. I will follow it up with a question. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I don't want to take your time from anyone else. Um, but has there been any, um, has Congress made any moves to tighten up this Article 1, Section 9 so that in the future there isn't questions as to who should uh, use it. Right. Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, not to my knowledge, um, I, I did sort of forget to mention, there's a new book out by a, a very distinguished scholar at Harvard named Noah Feldman. He is the, he holds the Felix Frankfurter chair and he has written a book called The Broken Constitution. I do have a copy, hang on. Uh, it's right here, and in the, in the book, here it is, The Broken Constitution. You can see I've got a lot of stickies. Each one of them represents something that I think is wrong about the book. Now, I, I know that I'm certainly not a, I am not a constitutional scholar at Harvard, for sure. I'm an appellate court judge sitting here in Hartford, but I think the book is filled with unfair arguments, and filled with really shocking state shocking statements, and I'm I'm lucky because I'm I'm going to be given the opportunity to write a book review for the Connecticut Supreme Court Historical Society Journal. This book has little to do with the Connecticut Supreme Court, but the editor said, "Sure, if you want to write something, go ahead." This is this has um, caused a great deal of controversy. Uh, his book, responses to his book responses to the responses, and it set off a whole huge fight in academia, which I, I cannot and will not go into now. But this is called The Broken Constitution, Lincoln, Slavery, and the Founding of America, Noah Feldman. Feldman is an absolute, and he, ar he argues his case that Lincoln had no right to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, no right to use military force to prevent secession, and that the Emancipation Proclamation was unlawful. So he's right down the line. He thinks, and he, he refers to Lincoln as a, as a tyrant. I mean, he uses the word tyrant repeatedly. I think at one point he says he was a tyrant for a period of weeks or something. Uh, I'm not sure he ever came out and said Lincoln was a tyrant. 
but there's a whole chapter where he, he basically says um, Lincoln acted in a tyrannical way, which I think is totally wrong. Um, Judge Levine, we have um, Stuart, or excuse me, Graham has a question, and then we have a question from Carol. I'm going to start with Graham's. Sure, if sure. Lincoln had recognized the South as a belligerent nation, how does the writ apply to non-citizens? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. Um, there are those who say he should have simply let the Southern states go. And uh, in my opinion, if if that, I mean, this is obviously hypothetical, but if the Southern states had been permitted to just form their own nation, the Confederate States of America, and a slave nation, which by the way, might have continued expanding, but if, I don't think the writ of habeas corpus would have any uh, extraterritorial impact or effect at all. Now, during the wars with Iraq, in Afghanistan, and Iraq especially, you may be aware at Guantanamo, the issue of detaining people without trial has been heavily litigated and going on. In fact, um, Sheikh Abdul, I forget his name, the head of the, uh, so the guy who's supposed to have set up the nine, uh, you know, the attack on our country um, is, uh, I think he's, I think he may still be detained there unless they've moved him. I don't know. Someone can help me out on that. But that's that's a continuing issue. But that relates to people who are far nationals who arguably declared war on the United States of America. So it's very different. But to answer your question, if it was a separate nation, I can't see how Lincoln would have been able to use the writ of habeas corpus at all. OK, and Carol, you had a question. Do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I read that um, George W. Bush, as part of the um, military law that he um, signed um, after the 9-11 suspended, tried to suspend uh, the writ, writ of habeas corpus for anybody involved with 9-11 and that it was overturned. I wanted to know what your thoughts were about that. Uh, I, I, I really don't know the facts at all, at all, but I think I did read something along the way that there was, it was mentioned or there was an attempt, but you don't hold me to it. Uh, I mean, my personal view would be that the, the problem with what Lincoln did, some say, is it provided a very bad precedent for people who were not as noble, intelligent, and uh, concerned about civil liberties as he was. And I, I share the view that it, it, you can't just say, oh, Lincoln did it, I'm gonna do it. So I don't know all the facts, but I would say that I can't imagine a situation right now where suspending the writ of habeas corpus would be a good thing. And so if that was suggested, Speaking as a citizen only, I'm glad it didn't happen. And I certainly hope that no future president would casually or in a very thoughtless way attempt to do anything like that. Thank you. I think you agree, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any other questions? Anybody? Well, thank you so much, Judge Levine. This was very informative and really get everybody thinking. Uh, it was really a great presentation, a lot of information. Um, I do want to, before we go today, thank everybody for joining us. And just to briefly um, share with you a couple of upcoming events that we have. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is Tuesday, November 15th, and we'll talk a little bit about, um, it's called From Gardner's Wharf in uh, Rhode Island to Elizabeth Street. So looking at uh, slavery in Rhode Island uh, in the CHS archives. And this is um, one of the New England Regional Fellowship, Fellowship Consortium. Um, he 
won a grant. So he came and did some research with us. So we're looking forward to what he has found in our archives. And then, of course, we have a new exhibition opening on November 17th called The Bicycle Game. This is a very different type of exhibition that we're holding. Um, it's sort of interactive. It will be informative about the bike craze uh, of the 1880s and, of course, Connecticut's role um, in manufacturing bicycles but it is uh, a very game-based uh, sort of exhibition. So we hope maybe you can join us for the reception that is uh, at Elizabeth Street at our location, and that is free and open to the public. And then we are doing our behind the scene tours of remembering G. Fox and Company. We have a very large collection of uh, all sorts of material from G. Fox. That is um, a tour we're holding at 11 or at two, you would need to register ahead of time uh, that is on site and that is for a fee. And, and all of this, of course, is uh, you can find information about th these at our website if you're interested. But we hope you will join us again. And um, there's lots of thank yous in uh, the chat, uh, Judge Levine. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. This was another great lunch and learn. I'm so happy that we're able to uh, bring these to everyone, such interesting topics and really get us thinking. All right, well, election day is uh, next Tuesday, a week from today. So we'll hope everyone is inspired to, to go to the polls. All right, thank you everyone. Bye thank now. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Jen. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.